New York traffic stopped when gorgeous Lillian Russell, musical comedy queen and America's most courted woman, pedalled up Fifth Avenue on a gold-plated bicycle studded with diamonds, rubies, sapphires and emeralds. The cycle was a gift to her from that millionaire playboy and Wall Street genius Diamond Jim Brady. He was the man who poured a million dollars into Lillian's lap and begged her to marry him. With a smile, the lovely Lillian, who was to have four husbands, turned Diamond Jim down, but they remained friends for 40 years. It was a beautiful friendship, but New Yorkers wondered how any woman could deny anything to the fabulous, generous and human-hearted Brady. When he died in his glass-cased $1,000 a week suite in Atlantic City on April 13, 1917, Broadway dropped its cynicism and openly and unashamedly wept. Diamond Jim, the men and women of the Great White Way, declared, was a swell guy. Diamond Jim, James Buchanan Brady on his birth certificate, had earned their regard. He had done more to make Broadway gay, the gayest spot on earth, than any other of the mushroom growth of millionaires of his day, the newborn tycoons upon whom affluence showered as railroads snaked their way across the continent and oil wells gushed. Chorus girls and socialites whooped it up for 17 hours at a time at Brady's wild parties, where champagne flowed like water. His jewels blazed from the front row at every first night, and his boundless generosity staggered its recipients. In fact, his heart was as big as his stomach, and that, the doctors found, when they operated on him, was six times larger than it should have been. An American era ended when Diamond Jim died, an era of rocketing fortunes, wild parties, reckless expenditure and scintillating profligacy, an era that caused a popular misconception in other parts of the world that millionaires made up the majority of America's population. The greatest of New York's good time Charlies began his life like many other American notables as a poor boy from the Bowery on Manhattan's squalid east side. He was born above his father's waterfront saloon in 1856 and had learned to pull a cork for the thirsty and not over-refined clients before he knew his alphabet. His schooling was limited, and at an early age he had to augment the family income by luggage smashing at Central Station and later as a messenger with Western Union and a Wall Street firm. American industry was writhing with growing pains. Business tycoons were mixing it with the tooth-and-claw jungle of Wall Street and the Chicago Exchange as steel firms and railroads mushroomed with the promise of huge fortunes for those who dared to speculate. Brady became a drummer, a travelling salesman, and, although one day he was to have 300 suits, he had to borrow a classy rig before he could first go on the road to push a new-fangled hacksaw, which his shrewd judgment knew would be a winner. He hoarded his money and bought a diamond ring with his first $90. It was the first of the 2,548 diamonds and 19 rubies with which one day he was to bespangle his bulging person for the walk down Wall Street to the sumptuous suite from which he conducted his vast deals. He always said that the first diamond brought him luck, and it is a fact that as soon as it flashed from the left hand he got his big break. An enterprising firm had taken a gamble in steel railway carriages, but they were before their time. Railroads wanted wooden carriages, and the steel ones went begging. Brady bought his high-pressure spiel to the bear on the firm. He told them he could sell their steel carriages, but he wanted exclusive sale rights to them and a 33 one-third percent commission on every car he sold. His bluff was colossal, but the firm was desperate and fell for it. As the railroads reached out towards the west coast and traffic increased with growing populations in California, makers of wooden railway carriages could not meet the demand for rolling stock. Steel coaches were the only alternative, and once companies used them, they discovered their advantages. The boom for steel carriages began. Railroads clamoured for them. Their highest executives had to go hat in hand to Brady, who graciously sold to them at a price. Business was so good that his 33 and a third percent commission neared the seven-figure mark. However generous he might have been in his chorus girl private life, there is no doubt that James Buchanan was a tough nut in business. He had no highfalutin notions about service and the destiny of the people. Business was business, and no one could persuade him that it was not governed by cutthroat jungle law. Those who attended his costly parties that rioted through the night while a benevolent bejeweled cherub beamed on them had little knowledge of the ice-cold brain 
that sat from nine to five behind the desk in Wall Street and toothed and clawed with the gentlemanly brigands who infested that part of New York. Whenever he could, Brady stuck him up. Even the mighty J. Pierpont Morgan, that great financial gorgon, had to pay Brady a rake-off before a Morgan colliery could supply Morgan's coal to the Morgan Railroad. If I do nothing else the rest of my life, I'll break that man, Morgan raved, but he could not, for Brady had raked all the big railroad executives into a supply company of which he was the kingpin. Further, he had persuaded them to grant a railroad supply monopoly to the new company. It was as neat and watertight a racketeering tie-up as ever confounded an outraged industrial dictator. And so the millions poured in. Brady could have died a multi-millionaire many times over, but he didn't. Forced into what is believed never to have been more than a platonic relationship with the ravishing Lillian Russell, who would allow him to be neither number one nor number five in her galaxy of husbands, he decided to spend the money as he made it. He burst upon Broadway in a blaze of jewels. From his teeth to his underwear he glittered. Jewels were his luck. He never forgot how he dazzled clients and hotel clerks into subservience by the first gem that had blazed from his finger. Soon he had twenty sets of fifteen pieces each, including scarf pens, rings, shirt studs, cuff links, buttonholes and suspender clasps. Each set was worth from $50,000 to $100,000. But most of all, he loved six special sets in diamonds, diamonds and rubies, pearls, emeralds, rubies and cat's eyes, which he wore in strict rotation, so his associates and the waiters at the luxury restaurants where he gorged could tell the day of the week by the jewels he wore. Brady's jewels became so well known that no thief would ever dare rob him. He always wore a $9,000 jewelled watch, gems worth $1,500 which was set, was set in his walking stick and umbrella handles. His garter clasps and braces were composed of jewels, while priceless stones served as fasteners on some of his underwear. His chief love was a ring set with a great diamond surrounded by rubies. But this gem was so large it covered three fingers. Some of his jewelled shirt studs were in the form of miniature bicycles and motor cars, while his cufflinks resembled locomotives and the carriages that had brought him wealth. Each night, scintillating with jewels, he presided over glittering parties, some costing as much as $100,000. Each beautiful guest, and he loved the society of pretty, vivacious women, would receive a diamond brooch or watch worth more than $1,000 as a memento of the occasion and yet he never married, perhaps because he was too much in love with Lillian Russell. One day, after a rebuff from her, he laid his head on his arms and sobbed, There ain't no woman in the world would marry an ugly-looking guy like me. He went to inordinate lengths to give people pleasure. To please Lillian, he ordered the first horseless carriage to be seen in New York, an electric brougham, built to his own design. It had a semicircular glass front, and a hundred concealed lights which reflected Lillian's blonde beauty and Jim's blaze of diamonds as adoringly he took her for a ride. On gala occasions on his New York Jersey farm, exquisitely dressed milkmaids milked his pedigreed cows into pails plated with gold. Every year he spent a quarter of a million on refurbishing his luxurious brownstone mansion on West 86th Street, distributing the already used old furniture among friends. A whole floor of the mansion was devoted to his wardrobe, which included his 200 suits and 5,000 handkerchiefs. Sometimes he had as many as five parties running at a time. Inevitably he was imposed upon, but it's fun to be a sucker, he would say, if you can afford it. He boasted that he never ran into debt and never spent a penny he had not already earned. He poured out thousands of dollars on champagne for his friends, but never drank a drop himself. Alcohol, tobacco, tea and coffee he loathed. While his guests drank themselves under the table, he satisfied himself with orange juice. His associates wondered how he kept up the pace. No matter how late he was whooping it up at the party, he was always at his desk the next day and his holding steadily grew. Ultimately he was president, vice president or director of seven companies, while the Standard Steel Company, which he organised, practically owned the town of Butler, Pennsylvania. Most of the wage earners among his 25,000 inhabitants of the town were employed at his works. Railway contracts continued to pour in, some for as much as $7,500,000 a time. Perhaps one of the secrets of his stamina was his colossal appetite. 
he would have a light breakfast of beefsteak, a few chops, eggs, flapjacks, fried potatoes, hominy, cornbread, and a few muffins and several beakers of milk. About 11.30 after a swim, he consumed two or three dozen oysters as an appetizer. Lunch usually consisted of more oysters and clams, a deviled crab or two, perhaps a pair of boiled lobsters, a joint of beef or a steak, a salad and several kinds of fruit pie, washed down by two quarts or more of orange juice and topped off with the better part of a box of chocolates or candy. There was a snack, of course, in the afternoon, perhaps more seafood and several bottles of lemon soda. His dinner of 15 courses would include more oysters, more lobsters, more steaks, smothered in chops, five or six vegetables, more salad and dessert. It would be followed by a midnight snack or two of three warm birds, once he devoured six chickens at a sitting, and he always kept a box of candy handy, just in case he became a little peckish. Where did he put it all? In 1912, doctors had to open him up. They found his stomach was six times the normal size, and to use his own expression, fitted him up with a new one. He was so thankful for a few more years of fun that he gave $200,000 to the John Hopkins University Hospital to found a urological clinic, and a further $15,000 a year to support it. With all of his gorging, there can be little surprise that his podgy form weighed 250 pounds and that when he died it was stated that the sudden heart attack that killed him was superinduced by acute indigestion. One of his last acts was to buy his dog a pair of glasses set with rose-coloured diamonds worth $6,000. He bought himself a platinum-based jewel in the form of an American flag studded with diamonds and valued at $3,500. This generous man had one final magnificent gesture for the world. During his life he lent generously to any friend with a hard luck yarn. IOUs had accumulated in his safe until they represented $200,000. As he was dying, he tore them all up and burned them. If I'm going to die, I'm going to die, but I ain't going to leave trouble and heartache behind me, he said. He slipped peacefully away in his sleep, leaving a fortune variously estimated at from 5 to $20 million, most of which he divided between his clinic at the John Hopkins and the Society of the New York Hospital. Diamond Jim's diamonds were then worth two million. He took the best set with him to the grave.